Mr. Misfit. Hi, my name is Jared Stacy. I was uh, raised in St. Petersburg or Tampa Bay area in Florida. Uh, I was born into a first generation Christian family. Uh, I grew up in church. I went to Christian school. Uh, all of those things were blessings and at the same time the architecture where I learned that I was also a sinner. So I like to talk about uh, growing up in fundamentalism, evangelicalism had its benefits and it also had its uh, collapsing ruins and all of, the, all of those things kind of came together for me to be able to say I can't talk about coming to faith and being a converted follower of Jesus outside of what evangelicalism has become. And so it's a host of contradictions uh, and a conversion that took place in these spaces. And so all of my life now following Jesus in these spaces, out of these spaces, and articulating what it looked like to follow Jesus in those spaces, uh, it's endlessly generative. It's always finding out other ways to say, how did I come to believe this about God? Where God comes in and says, uh, that's not who I am, but I'm delighted to show you who I really am. So uh, there is a lot that I've benefited from in evangelicalism, but that there's also a lot that evangelicalism has formed me uh, in ways that Jesus wants to unform me. And so I think a lot of people can resonate with that uh, experience. But uh, all I can say now is following Jesus is this journey of being converted into some really surprising new paths and new ways and new relationships. And that's exactly what I believe uh, the kingdom is, is this endlessly expanding place and space in time where God is creating a new people. And I am thrilled to be a part of that in my own particular way uh, here in Scotland. So I've been here in Scotland for about three years. Uh, we moved from the States where I was a pastor for 10 years before that. Uh, I am a PhD candidate uh, here at the University of Aberdeen studying conspiracy theories uh, in American evangelicalism and particularly bringing that all to bear on January 6th. So great to be here. Uh, again, my name is Jared Stacy, and uh, that is a little bit of my story of coming to know and follow Jesus Christ. Hey everybody, welcome back to Misfits. We are, well I am here, and finally getting to have this discussion that I've been trying to have for years and nobody outside of Joe Day was willing to do it, but Joe is unavailable for right now, and that's okay because we actually found an expert in the field. <laughs> Not just somebody that was willing to have the discussion with me, but an expert in the field that's willing to have the discussion with me. So, for those of you that have no idea who I'm talking about, Jared Stacy is here with us, streaming in from uh, Scotland, and he is a PhD candidate that specifically is looking at what I've been calling the theology of conspiracy theories. He's got a different name for it that's way more technical, and we'll get into that in a little bit. But for what we're dealing with today, he's actually looking at the theology of conspiracy which is stuff that we've been talking about on here for a while, but now we can actually have somebody that's an expert say, see, he's been telling you the truth all along. <laughs> so, Jared, welcome to Misfits. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. How? Let's just start with this part of it, because, again, this is something where people say, I created, I just made this field up, and that doesn't actually exist. <laughs> yeah. The theology of conspiracies, or more along the lines of what you're actually studying, how... How did this whole thing come about? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I think I'll, I'll answer it in two ways. Uh, the first is that I was raised in it. Um, I was raised in broadly fundamentalist and then broadly evangelical spaces. So, um, for example, like I remember, and I wouldn't call it conspiracy theory. I didn't call it then, but I would call it now. Um, <laughs> sitting in sermons like after 9-11 and the months right after 9-11, mm -hmm. I, uh, I was in elementary school, junior high uh, at the time. So I remember hearing sermons talking about uh, if we didn't stop. Uh, it was They were just full of Islamophobia, right? So if we didn't stop, the logic went, if we didn't stop uh, Muslims in the UK, then... Muslims would come to America and would destroy mm -hmm. it. Um, that's it. That's a conspiracy theory. Um, so uh, I, I received and was formed by a conspiratorial read of the world. Uh, 
and that was part of what it meant for me to be Christian. Left Behind was a huge part of that. So I read the young adult version of those um, books. And so some of your listeners might know that. Um, and, and then the second aspect of how I got here was related to just being a pastor. So um, knowing and being formed by the, that kind of expression in the States and then coming to pastor in it, you, you were familiar with it as well. Uh, that there were all, all there was always this kind of element or stream uh, in churches where there was a certain set of people, or or maybe a broader set where it's like, hey, like maybe we're going a little bit too far, or again, someone saying, oh, when are we going to get deeper with the Bible? And what they meant was, when are we studying Revelation? And when are we getting into predicting, you know, what Russia is doing as part of uh, an apocalypse? So in, a, in an immediate sense, uh, 2020 was kind of where all of that kind of fused together. And, and when I came to do my PhD, working with my supervisors as a community here, it really became apparent that um, the conspiracy theories that arose globally during the pandemic and particularly in America with uh, our politics um, was a window into talking about how Christians narrate our world and how that narration comes to coordinate our political actions mm -hmm. and form us and our moral imagination. So there's a lot of elements that we're talking about here, but for me, the the kind of the the, the path into talking about this was I was I was raised in it, and that and that I pastored in it, and and pastoring people who were coming to me saying things like you know, the election was rigged and, and all, and, and the, the pastoral pressure that when are you going to speak to this or, right. or how are we going to deal with this? You know, that Antifa was at January 6th or Antifa was infiltrating black lives matter when really it was like a prayer rally and it wasn't even affiliated with black lives matter. Right. So these kind of conspiratorial explanations and suspicions were, had theological charges to them. And, uh, and so I was, I was dealing with that as, as many of your listeners probably were too. Like this is an existential thing that all of us in some ways are experiencing in our families and our friend circles and our churches. And so it's a window into theology and that's what my project has developed and built on. Right. And that's what, you know, the, the term we use for everything you just described is cold war theology. Okay. So this is the stuff that it, you know, it became big and well-known during the cold war but like you said it's been going on for much longer especially right. those especially from the fundamentalist root mm -hmm. and the the puritanical root and everything yeah. else this has been going on for a long time and it's very rare to find somebody that has not dealt with it in some fashion if you've right. gone to church in the u.s over the past right. 150 years right so let's start breaking some of this down and actually the first thing we probably need to do is actually define what conspiracy is because this is something that gets thrown around and typically the way it gets thrown around is either somebody is denying a conspiracy because they're saying it's not a conspiracy because look 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 or they're trying to label something a conspiracy that isn't actually a conspiracy they just don't like it so yeah. what actually is the definition for conspiracy as we move through all of this? Yeah. Would you believe me if I told you there's there's people who disagree on how to define it? <laughs> oh, shocker. Shocker. Um, so let me let me narrate this for us uh, in a way that I think is helpful. Um, you have certain certain scholars who will say, look, a conspiracy theory is any explanation of any event that cites a conspiracy of human beings right? As its chief cause, right? So that's a very narrow view. It's basically saying, look, uh, is a conspiracy of people, the chief cause for whatever event. And what they're going to ask for is evidence-based, like, can we, can we prove this in an, in a objective, rational, um, enlightenment account? Can we say this is true? Then there's another, another group of people who say, no, 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 no. If, if we adopt that definition, then we all become conspiracy theorists, right? Uh, that that basically the 9/11 commission that says look uh, here were here were Saudi actors who were funded by these governments uh, came out and and hijacked planes on 9/11 and, and threw them flew them into the World Trade Center and the Pentagon that it technically counts as a conspiracy theory and and so there are others who say look that that account doesn't fully describe or depict the crisis of conspiratorial thinking now what I'm not trying to do here is muddy the waters. 
Right. But well, those I mean, are different think- approaches. And uh, what I think, and, and just to kind of land the plane, I think what's helpful for listeners to understand is that conspiracy theories arise because people are trying to narrate the world around them and, and give meaning to unexplainable chaotic events. And there's a, there's a portion in that in which we could take a step back and say, getting called a conspiracy theorist today is like tantamount to be, being slurred and being slandered. Right. So uh, we, we can, as Christians, say, okay, we too are trying to narrate our world in a different way. That is a common ground that we have. On the other hand, when conspiracy theories are full of anxiety, fear, um, not pathological, but like paranoia, right? Uh, then as Christians, we can start to say, well, there's something different here. So I probably muddied the waters a bit saying, oh, well, there, here's a, there's a lot of definitions. Well, I don't think you did because part, part of what we, what I typically see with all of this is that part of the issue is that you have people that assume that if it's a conspiracy theory, that means that it automatically is some kind of falsehood. Hmm, but part yeah, of what you said is that technically speaking, a conspiracy doesn't have to be false. A conspiracy is just the the method in which something is going on. It's the same thing we deal with, especially within Christianity, when we get to the word myth. We assume mm-hmm. myth must be false, but myth mm-hmm. just means it's an oral story. All of scripture is actually mythology because that's the style of, that's what it is. It is a story of the God. Right. It doesn't mean it's false. It just, it's just the you know, it's the label that gets put on it because that's what it is. And so that, that is actually a helpful thing to understand as we walk through this. Yeah. Just because it's a conspiracy doesn't necessarily mean it's false. The problem comes in with the other word you just used. And this is where we're actually going to probably get into more of the discussion is that the, the conspiracy theories that when we use the word, the way that the media uses it or anybody, really anybody at this point uses it right now in this day and age, is fear Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that is really the key piece to what when we are talking more so in terms of this is a conspiracy Mm -hmm. the fear as our outlook on the world is much more of where this sort of falls into place yeah so outside of christianity yeah Fear is going to happen, all that stuff. It That's really not what we're focused on, at least within Misfits. And I doubt even within, considering what you're doing as far as the theology behind it, I doubt really that's your focus either. But It's part of it. Right, it it's got to be in, well, but the bigger picture for us right now is why is it that American evangelical Christianity, especially white evangelical Christianity in America, is so prone to, to falling for Mm -hmm. fear-based conspiracy so there's two dimensions to that and and the first is realizing that those those identities that you labeled off i think white american evangelical um that realizing that every white american evangelical is first and foremost a modern person which means that as a modern person they're breathing the air of the enlightenment we all are and the enlightenment came on the heels of the sun. I'm, I'm, I'm narrowing, I'm going there, but hold on just a second. So the, <laughs> the enlightenment came on the heels of the scientific revolution, Newton, gravity, all of a sudden science told us that the world was ordered and was predictable in some certain ways. And what happened in the enlightenment is that suddenly people began to take the ordering of the natural world and apply it to the social world. Mm-hmm. So suddenly all the events in the political became conspiratorial Uh, we didn't have a way to explain complex political events in any other way it was we human beings are the only actors the only the only shapers of our worlds and so conspiracy theory was actually a a, a kind of a normed way of talking about that in the 1700s in the american revolution so when we say why do white american evangelicals believe conspiracy today Part of the reason is that before we are all those things, in some ways, we are all those things breathing the modern air that says human beings are the the sole determining causes and effects of everything that goes on. Mm -hmm. So when someone tries to narrate a really complex event like COVID in terms of Joe Biden did this or Joe Biden did that, 
what they're really trying to do is trying to hold on to this way of seeing the world where human beings are the ones who do everything. So that's one thing. <clears throat> but the second thing for American Christians, evangelical Christians, this is where we get in the theology part. So right, we're breathing this modern air, but it's, it's a modern air that's also going down the stream of church history. Yes. So what's going on here is, let me put it very, very, very directly apocalypse this idea that god has unveiled himself in history and now everything's changed see there is an element of that confession that we confess that jesus has disclosed revealed himself in history that is received by a lot of american evangelical christians as the chief alternate fact mm-hmm so when you believe, A, that human beings are <clears throat> solely directly responsible for every action in the world, which I, I, have, I have issues with that because we are shaped beyond ourselves in ways that we struggle to articulate. But then secondly, when we believe and we believe Jesus changes everything, I'm not contesting that. What I'm contesting is receiving the claim that Jesus changes everything as a way to say, see, I told you this vaccine was dangerous because as a Christian, right, we believe this alternative truth. Jesus is not. And this is where we get into the, the contentious part of it and the pushing back. Is it just because Jesus has changed the logic of how we narrate the world? That doesn't mean that Jesus gives us the license, right, to become epidemiologists. Right. To, it doesn't mean that we have hidden insight into all of these closed door shadowy worlds. Uh, and so what, what we're trying to rescue Christian theology from is this idea, and this is what's happening with evangelicals, is that not only are they breathing modern air, but they've got a theological problem. We have a theological problem where we come to believe that we alone see things rightly and that we have the keys to narrate our worlds around us better than anyone else. And the problem with all this is, right, when you combine this with reactionary politics, when you combine mm -hmm. this with nationalism then it, it almost becomes a combustible chemical uh you know reaction that becomes very explosive in the political and so how much it, how much do ahead. you think that what you were just talking about as far as reactionary pro politics and especially yeah. among christian nationalists how much of that that scenario that setting that we've got yeah is actually a result of the way that christians have dealt with this idea of conspiracy and fear and everything yeah. like that within the, within American culture, yeah. how, how much do you think is actually a, you know, if we're talking chicken and egg, yeah. which, which one of these actually is, is the chicken here? Um, I, I think it's, I, uh, I think it's a little bit of both and that's probably the academic in me trying to create some, some nuance um, that these are where we're, we're, we're receiving this as one reality. I think that's probably the important point. Like people existentially, people receive this in their lived existence as one and the same. So the, the problem is, is that when you look at the, like COVID conspiracies or uh, the stolen election conspiracies, mm -hmm. you know, like it's really hard to articulate and, and it almost impossible to, to refute these. Con Has anyone tried to argue a conspiracy? Have, have you like, have you tried to do that and say, well, why do you believe that? Oh, um, are you talking to me personally? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Saying, oh yeah, I get yeah. we I mean and th and this is part of why like I said this is part of why we've been wanting to do this talk for a while yeah. is that one of the things that we get pushed back a lot on is this idea of well you know insert whatever conspiracy you know I just had somebody this morning that was arguing flat earth. Mm -hmm. I had somebody yesterday that was arguing um that was arguing a bunch of the replacement theology that led to, you know, yeah. somebody was blaming the Jews for nine 11. Yeah. I had somebody uh, last week that was saying, well, you obviously have no basis in reality because look what you're saying about January 6th. Yeah. Right. But, and, and the thing that I find at least is that most of it is actually people that are responding to the theology that we are preaching rather than actually responding to me with the event directly. Unpack that for me. Help me help me understand. Yeah. That. So so this is and and this is part of what I think and 
you know, I think you would probably agree the the word I use for it instead of talking just the you know children of the enlightenment type of thing is we're we're dealing with humanism mm. in mo- most yeah, that's, cases. That's, a, that's another good way of putting it. You know, we're dealing with human, and this is part of what, especially again, when we talk America, America yeah. was built on humanism. I right. mean, that's what the entirety of the Constitution actually, the way it's set up, everything is based out of humanist theory. Capitalism is based off of humanist theory. All of these different things that make up America are based off of humanism. Yeah. And what we actually, what I'm finding at least, is that the majority of people that are more likely to start saying, yeah, but, in response to something, then put out a conspiracy theory. Mm-hmm. Is it is again? We're back into the the gospel is spiritual. Yeah, yeah. we are physical, and yeah. because we are humanists in our base DNA, we can't reconcile the two. Yeah, yeah. and so either <clears throat> everything has to be spiritual, and so Jesus is bigger than the vaccine, so why would I trust it? Right, right, right. Or everything has to be physical, and so separation of church and state only when it's when it's beneficial to me yeah 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 so what what you're so one of the ways that uh scholars talk about conspiracy theories they they use this term out it's great fluid epistemology right Ooh. that it it is amorphous um my my kids watched a youtube video uh yes it was fascinating about uh octopuses octopi is it octopi or octopuses probably octopi grammar doesn't matter on this yeah. show, so. <laughs> um but i didn't know this but uh an octopus can basically fit into any size hole and through it uh, so long as it has room enough for its small little beak to fit through. Mm-hmm. So, so that's a great, and you know, it, 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 ironically enough, an octopus is actually a symbol for a lot of conspiracy theories that kind of look at all these different, you know, it's Hydra. Oh, Hydra, all that. Yeah, it's Hydra, okay. That's based, Marvel did not invent that. That's based on real world conspiracy imagery right. that talks about whether it was Roman Catholicism that that's taking control or, or Jewish conspiracies, right. Of uh, bankers and shadowy groups taking control of these organizations, right. The octopus just kind of, so, but here, here's what we really need to think about conspiracy theories with that is that they're fluid and they can fit and conform to really do damage control. (laughs) Like conspiracy theory is kind of the projection of fear, anxiety, and the resolution Mm -hmm. of fear and anxiety by narrating events that are favorable to your own ideological persuasion. Um, and that I'm, what I'm really contending with and getting down to is how that looks so similar to the apocalyptic witness of the church. I'm not talking about end times. I'm talking about apocalypse as the church narrating reality, according to Jesus Christ. So I love what you said earlier. And we've all, we've all heard this. You don't live in reality, right? Right. Like having a conversation with someone, you're like, this is, are we inhabiting the same, the same world here? And, and I've had conversations with people who, who aren't practicing Christians who would, would pathologize me in that way, just as a, I'm not, you know, I'm not going out here talking about vaccines. I'm not talking about, you know, stone elections, but as a Christian, I might as well be because in that, in that standard, like conspiracy theory and theology are kind of kindred pathologies from that approach. And so I, I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to do is trying to stand in a really, really really, really difficult place. Uh, and on the one hand say, Hey, um, conspiracy theory is not intrinsic to Christianity, right. but on the other hand, I'm not, I'm, I'm going to refuse to interpret my Christianity according to quote unquote, objective quote unquote, rational standards. And again, that's a really tenuous place to be. And some of your listeners be like, well, that that's contradictory. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's the paradox. I believe in a Jewish body, a Messiah with a Jewish body who entered history, Right. So there's a materiality there. This is not gnosis. But on the other hand, I could witness, we all could go back and witness Jesus's uh, crucifixion and still not be considered Christian Mm -hmm. because Christian is about faith, about interpreting that event, the meaning of that event, according to the hope of Israel. So again, like there, it's a really interesting place to be. It's, it's like, and I'm, I'm I'm kind of, we're standing here. it's, It's really the place that we're supposed to be though. Yeah, 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 and that's, this is what yeah. you know. This is something that when we when we get into January, we're gonna dive into a little bit more. But this is something that those of you that watch on Twitter, what's going on as far as the stuff that I'm, you know, I'm typically writing through and everything like that. This is one of those areas that has become very evident mm-hmm. over the past, you know, five six years, 
is that our I, our ecclesiology of what the church actually is is just gone. Mm-hmm. Like we can't we can't comprehend what it means to be in the world and of the world anymore. Mm-hmm. We can't comprehend what it means to stand in the middle of what he's talking about here as far as there's conspiracy, but it doesn't mean that it's how I interpret my faith. Right. There all these, you know, fear is no longer what controls me is, is the, is the bottom line. You know, the, they, they don't have to fit together. Right. Right. And show you they're together in the world. And that's, and that's kind of the tension that we're, we're inhabiting and recognizing that, you know, when the church watched Jesus ascend in Acts and suddenly was having to articulate this new space that God was forming. And I love how uh, Willie Jennings, Dr. Willie Jennings talks about the, the difference um, between the nationalist hopes of Israel and then the imperial hopes of Rome. Right. And how, and how the early church kind of grew up resisting in key ways, both of those pulls. And, and I think those, that kind of tension is reflected in what we're talking about here, because a lot of the disinformation activisms that look at Twitter and look at spaces like TikTok, where Chinese propaganda is, right. is all over the place. And, and we're really coming in grips with what is reality because we're all daily assaulted with our screens and this content that is formative and shapes our perception of what the real is. Um, and, 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 and that those activisms look at the church at January 6th and say, this is a problem. This is, this is combustible in our social and political worlds. But what I'm saying is the, the theological crisis that actually leads the church and white evangelical Christians to embrace this, particularly in our moment, it's all actually sealed inside theology. Mm-hmm. So you'll never, you'll never be able to appeal to a Christian who believes that the stolen election is a matter of the kingdom of God. You'll never be able to appeal for, to them on rationality and say, it, th- those votes were not, were not thrown away. And here's all the court cases to show that. That evidence has its place. But what I'm saying is if a, a Christian believes this, the election was stolen, in spite of that evidence, they're believing it for theological reasons. The, 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 the disinformation activisms that Congress is working on are not going to be able to get into this. The door is shut and it's locked from the inside. Mm-hmm. But, and, and not to be, not to be too, uh, well, we can say this, like we follow a God who enters through locked doors. Right. <laughs> and and that's, that's, the, that's the story post-resurrection. I mean, that's exactly. literally the story. So this is what, this is what we're attempting to narrate. We're attempting to serve our broader social and political order by saying, Hey, we're owning this problem. And it's a problem that actually only the church can really can, can get, get at, uh, and can only really contend with, but we have to use our own resources to do that. Now, this is before we get into how we actually do that. Yeah. There's one other section of this discussion. This is the part that everybody's like, Oh, I'd love to hear this discussion, but you're going to have to find somebody else to do it with. So, <laughs> How much do you think that the, because you, you mentioned it in your testimony a little bit and you mentioned it in here, how much of why, I guess the the public side of why the church has embraced conspiracy theories in the U.S. Mm-hmm. comes from the dispensational yep. DNA? Yep. How, how much of dispensationalism is actually responsible for the theological reasons why you know, Christians are running towards conspiracy yeah. theories. Yeah. You're, I'm, do your listeners know dispensationalism? Yes. Yes. Okay. We've, okay. Yeah. We can, so we, we can have, briefly describe it. So we're talking, this is an eschatological view yeah. of the world. And we're talking world history as far as the fact that God comes in different forms at different times and for different reasons. But this also gets pushed a little bit further into this is what the left behind books are talking about. Mm-hmm. This is very much literal reading of revelation, literal reading of da- of Daniel, real, literal reading of Matthew 24. All these different things are literal. It's going to happen this exact way. And everything is centered around the antichrist. Yep. It's fear-based. It's centered around that. And it started in the mid to late 1800s and then got really, really big in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and then really big in the 80s. 
Yeah. So I, what I, what I can say, Andrew, I mean, I'm, I was a, a card carrying dispensationalist. Um, and uh, if your readers are, 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 or were also, so I, I want to be careful too. There are Christians that I know who are still dispensationalist um, and would probably reject the notion that holding to dispensationalism outright makes them somehow prone to believing various conspiracies. Right. And so <laughs> part of what we say all the time, and and this is just in case anybody's listening that you know are your friends you just called out without saying their names. <laughs> Part of what we do within the the context of the misfit stuff is that we are looking at the culture yeah. and the theology and the ideologies. We are not talking about the individual people. Yep. You know the the card carrying dispensationalists that are prone to conspiracy theories are victims of bad theology. They are not heretics. They're victims of heresy. And that that's a key distinction. And again, this is falls into the conspiracy discussion as well. Just because somebody looks like they may be a part of some group that you've been told is the enemy does not make them your enemy. Mm. It's the group that you've identified that is your enemy, not this individual. And again, this is something that we as a church don't do well. We lump yeah. everybody into it, even though the church's call is not to have enemies, but to have neighbors. So there's a there's a really and there's a there's always a really difficult line to draw. And unfortunately, like end times or es eschatological doctrines is where we somehow find most of our heretical accusations and hurl them mm -hmm. that way. Where I'm I'm more disciplined recently out of that. Um, and maybe that for me in my particular uh, upbringing, like the, the heresy charge was also reflective of the way I held dispensationalism. I'm not a dispensationalist anymore, but it did factor into it in a huge way on how I perceived and narrated the world and my place in it. And so it's influential in that way. And that's not to discredit eschatology. That's to really say like eschatology does matter, but eschatology is also connected to the entire dogmatic landscape. Uh, of your Christology and your ecclesiology uh, and creation and all of these things bound up together. And so we're all uh, struggling to find a way to narrate the breadth and the depth of the meaning and measure of all things, <laughs> right? That, that's, that's an incredibly privileged opportunity we have in our time. Um, so to get back to the dispensationalism, um, I think I, Daniel Hummel makes this argument, actually, it's not my argument. He makes it in his history of dispensationalism that uh, some of the refractory or fragmentary elements of dispensationalism primed American culture to receive uh, the QAnon conspiracy mm -hmm. theory. And I think his analysis is right. Um, one of the aspects that I found from my research that I included in my dissertation um, was Tim LaHaye and his his left behind novels. Tim LaHaye was an avowed conspiracy theorist um, by his own admission uh, in one of his books, Rapture Under Attack, where he was responding to critics of the dispensational theory of the rapture. Um, he, he says like, I am an avowed conspiracy theorist. I believe in the Illuminati and their attempt to, through secular humanism, uh, to overthrow Christianity in America. So we're not, um, I've got receipts. We're not making this up. Um, you know, Tim LaHaye was a, a, not just a conspiracy theorist in the sense that I think this might have happened. I think there might've been a, a guy on the grassy knoll, uh, in November, 1963. No, it, he's, he's much more broad stroke, like what we would deem conspiracism that, mm -hmm. that it, it was a way of, and, and that conspiracism was theologically charged. It was framed by dispensationalism. That doesn't have to be the case for every dispensationalist. Um, I'm not going to stand here and say that it's intrinsic to it. But historically, uh, the way that Tim LaHaye's economic success have left behind and the way that those books entered into pop culture. So Hummel makes a great point, Ray, uh, and how, how we can notice Tim LaHaye's and the rapture in general shaping American culture um, and those end time scenarios is he goes, look at the end of Avengers. What does Thanos do? He snaps his fingers and half the world disappears. He goes, that's the rapture. Whether you realize it or not, mm -hmm. that is an apocalyptic or, you know, I don't like misusing that word. Ap apocalypse just means unveiling. It doesn't mean the end of the world. Um, however, uh, the, the Hollywood reception of it does mean end of the world, right? So as the end times uh, or the Avengers Endgame instead, as Avengers Endgame kind of looks at it, uh, that the rapture is the villain's success. And so... 
QAnon uh, takes together a lot of these cultural fragments and shards that have been littered around our cultural landscape and takes them up and constructs this house that looks really similar to the evangelical heritage and history and legacy. And most people don't know how to narrate this. Most people don't know. How, and that's fine. I'm, I'm narrating it now. But the appeal of QAnon is because it is visceral. Right. Because it feels so familiar. Of course, of course, there's going to be a coming storm to wipe out the uh, the global elite that are against Christians. Oh, okay. Like, if if you believe that Jesus will judge at the end of time uh, when he returns, then yeah, there's there's a uh, correspondence there. But the task of the church and theologians is to dispute that correspondence, right? But no, so I, I'm agreeing with your take. Uh, Hummel makes it in his analysis, and and I have yeah, it's it's a solid take that QAnon is picking up these these fr fragmented shards of evangelicalism, uh, and and in some cases not even fragmented. He's just moving right. into a house that evangelicals constructed, and that's um, and that's so yeah. the big thing. And, and you know, from what little bit I've seen of the work you're doing for your PhD, I mean that that literally is the the point of how we got to January 6th. Yeah. And this is why some people, you know, I predicted it in 2015. Um, our good friend, Joel Bowman predicted it around that same time. It's not, it's not hard to predict yeah. because like you said, we can see this all throughout both world history and church history as to what this level of theology produces. Right. Right. And the big piece to a lot of it, and this is the big piece to, you know, the left behind books is the fact that most of it is based off of fear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the fear of being left behind the fear of persecution, right? Because right. we've now mislabeled what persecution is, right? The fear of being the minority, because we, you know, going back into the cold war theology stuff, American culture has always believed that we are the Puritan city on the hill. Right. All of these sort of things led to the ripe conditions mm -hmm. for somebody that has the persona of I can overcome your fear. Right. Right. To be able to take charge. I mean, that's that's basically the argument that I make in my final chapter that is, you know, offering kind of a, a theological interpretation of January 6th is, is basically to say that there were a lot of there are a lot of elements across the landscape of American history, um, fear of the other, a racialized fear of the yes. other, um, greed, uh, violence. Um, all of these things have been part of not just the American experiment. They've showed up in the American experiment in particular ways interacting with evangelicalism, but they're, they're part of human history. They're the logics of empire that we see in Exodus um, in Egypt. Uh, and so these are things though, I make the case in my, 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 my project that they, they, the, all these elements were concentrated and came together in this very concentrated moment and form. And unless you acknowledge their Christian, and I say that kind of with quotes, right? Like, what is it? What, what are we talking about? But yeah, I have no problem saying they, they were, in some ways tied to and justified by a Christian grammar and logic. Mm -hmm. And so it's not enough. And I, I mean, I've been on the receiving end of this of hearing people say, well, they're not real Christians. I'm like, we don't get to adjudicate that. <laughs> we don't get to be the ones to decide uh, who's legitimate and who's not. And until that time when that is the separation uh, and when Jesus comes and deals with all of the ambiguity that we've lived with um, it's not our place. And we need to be responsible enough to say, well, what does it look like to be a follower of Jesus and how can we take this logic and destroy it um, if we perceive it to be a betrayal of the spirit of Jesus? Um, and, and that's, that, that's part that of it. That last piece is, is the key. And this is the key to how we actually deal with it in today's world as well, as far as when we're dealing, because like you said, logic is not going to work for, especially a Christian that has been fully, you know, yeah. drink the Kool-Aid, everything swimming in the Kool-Aid more like it in terms of some of these different things. The logical arguments are not what matters. Mm -hmm. There's a the it's got to be a theological argument. Mm -hmm. And the key piece to what you're talking about there is, you know, this is what we refer to it. The, it's the Christocentric theological argument. Yep. Because what is it that casts out fear? It's perfect love. Perfect love is found only in Christ. 
Right. So that's, and the great thing about that approach, and I hope your listeners hear this too, is that um, that doesn't demarcate, or I should say that doesn't eradicate the use of provisional, you know, like evidence of saying like, right. here's material uh, evidence. Here's all the court cases that Trump and his lawyers have lost <laughs> trying to defend, um, trying to defend the stone election fraud. Like that has its place. But as sociological studies continue to prove, it doesn't matter what happens in a court of law when Christians who believe the election was stolen do so because of a theological place. Right. So the, these have to go hand in hand, but our grip on the material stuff, all we have to realize is that the material stuff of these court cases and evidence, that's not the basis for a Christian response to conspiracy. That's, that's an auxiliary, right? That's, that's an apparatus. That's part of it, but it's not the thing. The content is Jesus and him crucified. And this but, is yeah, where keeps losing court cases and we need to talk about that. Right. Well, <laughs> and, and this is where, you know, you know, the first part of it, this is why, you know, for the longest time, I was one of the few that had been calling Christian nationalism out saying it yeah, doesn't mean they're not believers. Right. However, one of the things that I'm finding now is that the more we move through these discussions and the longer these discussions have, the more that we are starting to see these arguments that are theological arguments that are being denied as theology, they're yeah, being yeah. claimed to be political, that the basis is we cannot actually find Jesus in the argument. Mm. Mm. And when that is the case, the only response we can have is, do you actually even know who Jesus is? Right. There's a difference between looking at the fruit and saying, there's no Jesus here. Are you a believer in saying that, Oh, you disagree with me. So that makes you not a Christian. Yeah. Well, and, and uh, I think, I think that the latter reaction that you're just, you know, he, he, he who disagrees with me is disagreeing with God. That has a very long historical track record. Right. Um, and uh, I think, I think ample readings of scripture can show how, how dangerous that is. Um, but it also kind of proves the difficulty because across church history, there have always been expressions politically and socially of a divine right to rule and that I'm yeah. God's emissary on earth. And so those who claim to follow Jesus in that way, in some ways have a certain sort of history on their side and the church community, it's our task to say that might be true of a certain history but it's not the history of jesus christ right and being able to articulate that with our own resources and own theological confession i think that's that's our moment that's our task and i, I like to this point because what you're really talking about um at least how i'm understanding it is you we we are all caught up in this moment of not being able to know who the real christian is and mm -hmm. you have some people over here say well you know these people are these people aren't and in some ways that's not a new that's not a new situation. Right. Um, it's just a new, it's a new, uh, you know, new cover on it is all. Yeah. It is. Yeah. And, uh, like it's a, uh, it's, it's our life, <laughs> not, yeah. not the people that came before. Um, and I love what Bonhoeffer says, because I think there are some, some similarities in the visceral feeling and crisis. Oh, yeah. 100%. Yeah. Um, but I'm not going to stand here and, you know, say that we are living in 1930s uh, Germany. There's there's historical differences, um, plenty of them. But uh, what I like what Bonhoeffer says, though, because what I'm trying to drive home is that this existential point that uh, something new is going to come out of this, um, out of this fragment, out of this liminal space, this transitory time um, that we're always living in. Right. So there's going to be some letdown there. But I love what Bonhoeffer says that. Um, we don't create a new people. Mm -hmm. We can't create a new people. There are no, we, there is no new, as much as we might try to reform evangelicalism, repair it, uh, you know, whatever kind of movements that, you know, new institutions building I, th that all well may be good, but Bonhoeffer's point, I think stands because only, only the only thing we do to create a new people is pray. Like it is God that creates a new people. And that's the theological point. Cause I think what concerns me is we talk about this crisis of conspiracy theory and evangelicalism. And, and then that kind of generates its own, well, what do we need to do? <laughs> how, how do we make people who are conspiracy theorists aren't conspiracy theorists? How do we, once again, separate the real Christians from the fake Christians? And it's not that I'm 
implicating all of those questions is invalid as much as I'm saying, I think, I think the better question is uh, where, where are the praying people? And I don't mean that in like just a, uh, a light hearted Christianese Christian radio in the morning sense, like Bonhoeffer was writing that in the, in the shadows of the yeah. third right. And, and, uh, and the key yeah. thing to this is what you're talking about is those, those other questions are coming after you've already had the, where are the praying people discussion? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not the first thing you say is because all that is the, if the first response is well they're not a Christian because of this, yeah, then that you're doing the exact thing that we just talked about as far as what conspiracy actually is. Exactly. The exactly. way to defeat conspiracy is not to create more conspiracy. The way to yeah. deal with something in which the truth is being marred or hidden or used mm-hmm. as a weapon. Mm-hmm is to go to the source of truth, which is Jesus. And that's, and that's, I think we're going to find when we make that kind of move, a very profound demarcation of our ability to narrate things. So this might help in a, in a very live, because again, people do want, and I've felt this, people want to land it like, well, what am I, again, what am I supposed to do when confronted with these right. kind of claims uh, at, at work or on a Zoom call, you know, whatever. Um, one of the things I've found is that conspiracy theories tend to be characters of very complex evils. Mm-hmm. So let me let me just illustrate that real quick. Um, cons- QAnon, Q loves to talk about the deep state. And uh, I've, I've called this kind of theology deep state theology before, because that's a powerful concept that is animating Christians on the far right. It's, it's, but it's a theological concept. It's not necessarily, but it's tied okay, to a narration of how the U.S. state operates. So here's what I found. There's a whole massive difference between the conspiratorial deep state and the scholarly accounts of the national security state that Mm -hmm. that exists that veils its intentions that topples dictators that controls governments now i sound i might get mapped by a conspiracy theorist for saying things like this but my point is the difference between a conspiratorial deep state and the national security state of scholarly accounts is absurdity Mm -hmm. meaning you can't narrate this stuff (laughs) There is no the conspiracy theories fail not because they try to bring all these complex parts together, but because they try to do so in a way that's so simple that it could never be true. Right, right. And I think it's important that people hear that if conspiracy theories are looking for an easy, clear cut, I can blame this guy, I can blame this group of people, but nothing about human nature and human reality that we've so constructed is reflected in in those narrations that. What we, the way that our state exercises its power and its violence uh, is beyond our ability to narrate in direct human to human terms. And this is why I think theology has something to offer because this is a road into talking about and repairing one of the aspects of why evangelicals believe this stuff to begin with is because we have a misplaced conversation about spiritual warfare. Yes. And when the Bible talks about spiritual warfare, powers and principalities, we have a whole way to talk and narrate power in our world that actually doesn't create us and shape us as seeing demons behind every event, but it actually disciplines us to say, yeah, we don't really know how to narrate all of these very complex violence and power and darkness and evil, but it, but it happens and it, it's insidious and it's chaotic. But the most important thing, is that it's absurd that it evil is an absurdity and it defies our ability to narrate it. And Carl Bart would be the one to say, mm-hmm. we only see evil clearly for what it is in the light of Jesus Christ. So there's your Christological Christocentric point of view is that if, if you have people who are talking about demons and spiritual warfare and all these stuff, but I'm never talking about Jesus Christ, that is the way to repair and this- that kind of, theological conspiracism and, and this is where you know as, as we're closing this is part of why beyond just the other the other bigger picture things as far as government think, part of the reason why this is such a big deal for us as a church to get right is that it isn't just in the eschatology right. it's in our missiology as well mm-hmm. you know the, when we preach hell instead of jesus right 
Exactly. Fear is automatically the very big thing that everything is centered around. Yep. When we talked about our role as the church being soldiers of the Lord, rather than servants carrying our cross, we're going to get involved with all of these different ideas as far as violence and political power and everything yep. else. Yep. The way that we talk about ourselves as a church has to get back to a Christocentric model of discipleship yep. Yep. and not about power and fear and all of these other things. Because once those things start coming in, then all these other pieces start falling as well. I think it's helpful. The analogy that I've uh, come, I, I'm, I'm quoting uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury here in the UK, uh, the Anglican communion, Justin Welby. And he described British, uh, the British nation. Uh, the, uh, he, someone asked him, are we a Christian nation anymore? And he said uh, that we used to be, and now the shattered remnants of that canopy are just littered across our cultural landscape and politicians on both sides of the aisle take these shards and they use them as shibboleths or, or weapons to stab their political opponents. And I've always liked that. And I think it can apply to the U S as well. Um, even though Christianity took on a different shape. Um, but to your point, I know we're landing this thing, but, but to your point here, like the church's task, we often read the Bible like that too, like growing up in these spaces, like it, it was a chapter, it was a verse here, it was a verse there. And what happens, and this is Stanley Hauerwas, if people want to read more into this, mm -hmm. this is kind of his insight. He's an American theologian. This is his insight into the situation is to say that, you know, when we, when we look at the Bible as kind of this extraction operation for these little shards what ends up happening is you can you can carry this shard and it can be disciplined by a, a different logic, right? So like it's not the logic of the word; it's not Jesus Christ. But you can read the the metaphors in the Bible about spiritual warfare, and then come out saying, "Oh, without realizing it, uh, you know, I'm going to put on the armor of God." And without realizing it, you're trading in the logic of national defense, you're trading in the military industrial complex, and you're trading in capitalism all at the same time. Mm -hmm. So the church is a really unique, special place where the spirit of God is the one that's exposing our, our captivity to these logics and our way of narrating the world. And I, I'm, I, what I'm getting at, Andrew, is I'm actually kind of describing the surprise that I had in this project is saying, oh, man, I'm going to go into conspiracy theories and I'm going to look at this. And what I found out very quickly was that I was trying, I was pathologizing people. And, and then, but the, the constructive realization away from that was recognizing that what I'm really talking about in theology and conspiracy theory is how does the church narrate the moment that it's in with the resources that it has in mm -hmm. Christ. And, and that doesn't mean that conspiracy theory is intrinsic to Christianity. It means the exact opposite. But what I'm trying to do is demarcate all the ways where the, where the church can say, no, 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 we can't go that direction. We can't, we can't, we can't give up this whole word that we've been given that, that creates us. Um, but when we do, when we, when we break it up and we let it be disciplined by the logics of empire, then we give up the very word that is supposed to endlessly create our life. And then we become nothing but a political cause and political movement. And that's what MAGA, MAGA is. MAGA is a church. Right. I hope people understand 100%. That. It's a cult. MAGA is a church, but it's not a church with the life of Jesus Christ. It's a church that has given up that word. And so it cannot create. It can only destroy. And, and this is part of where, you know, as we close out, this is part of why, you know, some people have accused us of being just a political force. You know, we've been accused of being a CIA. We've been, I've, this was, you know, one of the, the trends I was doing on Twitter was listing the different accusations you've had. <laughs> and people were shocked because we, Misfits has been accused of being Illuminati. We've been accused of being the KJB, KGB. We've been accused of being the CIA. Because they're convinced that everything we're talking about is just all political nonsense and it's not actually theology. But part of the reason why we have to actually talk about some of these different political things from a theological perspective is because of the fact that the theology that we have been picking up already is inundated yeah. with political and ideological rhetoric. And in order for us to get rid of that rhetoric... It's got to be exposed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and, and and the the idea that because uh, I've I've heard that accusation too. Oh, you you you're too political, right. and uh, and that is is in and of itself a political statement, mm -hmm. right? 
So it says much of, more about their their politics than it yeah, does it's, ours. It's just showing where the boundaries have been drawn, and and the boundaries are always arbitrary, right? Mm -hmm. um, what someone discredits as politics, another person calls their morals, right? Mm -hmm. So there's there's all of those aspects that are caught up in this. But I think one of the things that I've had to learn and dispos dispossess myself of um, is that that being apolitical is not an option for a follower of Jesus Christ. Uh, the, but, but being determined by political ideologies is, is not an option either. Um, so the gospel is inherently intrinsically political, um, but its politics takes on the shape of the cross. Mm -hmm. And I think what happens a lot of time, because it's in these spaces where we say, Jesus wasn't political, stop making it political. When you give up, what they're doing is they're giving up the idea that your politics should be disciplined by Jesus Christ. And so there's this weird space where suddenly, Oh no, no, Jesus doesn't speak to this. This is not something now politics are always provisional. There's always different approaches that Christians can have and take that don't always line up or don't always agree. And so there's, there's a, our communion is not built on it. That's important. It's not mm -hmm. the party that, that we, that's not our communion. Um, but as but as the church takes on that task of disciplining itself by the word, like its political expression uh, will have a particular shape. Um, and it's a politics that doesn't always encroach into systems of governance. It might be local, <laughs> which is a politics that we're just not used to. Right. And, and well, and even the reason why we're not used to it is again a bigger picture of what we've yep. been talking about is the fact yep. that we we think that we're not in order to make the changes we need to change it has to be big yeah exactly you know, this, this exactly. is part of why we do the this is part of why we do the testimonies at the beginning yeah right it's because of the fact that even a small simple testimony of i was raised in fundamentalism and then as i became a christian or as i started no, reading yeah, Bible, I, realized I was divorced yeah. Yeah. yeah you know all these yeah. different things yeah it's a very simple statement. It's not some grand thing like you were saved out of drugs and rock and roll and everything else. It was just as simple as I got to know Jesus. This is where I, this is where he led me. I think the it's shocking such a thing, simple statement, but it's life changing, but we don't, we don't think of it that way. The shock. No, we don't. We don't. And I think, and I, I'll just leave your listeners with this. I think the, the shocking thing for me um, is coming to articulate, what I only experienced and felt viscerally. Um, but now being able to say it verbally is that the most surprising dimension of my conversion thus far has been the recognition that I'm being converted out of Christianity, mm -hmm. a particular type of Christianity, a particular expression. So I love how you phrase it, right? Like I became a Christian in fundamentalism, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a way. So uh, Kierkegaard, Soren Kierkegaard, who was in Denmark, Denmark theologian, he, I think offers us a way to say, yeah, when, when we are converted, we are converted out of the church. We are converted to Jesus, but that conversion is also a conversion into the church. <laughs> so it, it, it works both ways. Like the institutionalized, the, the, the cultural trappings that make up the scaffolding that we come to hear the word in an imperfect way, God, God makes much of that. And so I can't narrate my own testimony without the very tradition that now in some ways I'm spending, I've been spending the last mm -hmm. 10 years or so trying to articulate the problematic aspects of it, not as an act of contempt, um, but as an act of critical, constructive care and concern, you know? Um, and if our, if the word is Jesus, then we don't have to concern ourselves with the containers right. uh, that we don't have to confuse it. Uh, it's just a container and we, we, we can be grateful for, but, at, but at the same time, one that we don't have to hold up and worship. It, it's not an artifact for a cult. Uh, that's, that's freeing. Um, and, and I hope, I hope your listeners uh, kind of hear that from me as, as we wrap up. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So speaking of that's a, we probably, I have a feeling the two of us could go on for a while. Um, <laughs> yes, we could. <laughs> through, Cause we, there are multiple places where you, if you're watching the video, you can see multiple places where we opened our, both of us opened our mouths and then stopped. Cause we realized yeah. the time it was. So, <laughs> um, yeah. Tell people where they can find you. Um, everything you're over in Scotland doing your, your PhD work, but you're, you're still making things for the U S population yes. domestically and everything like that. So where can people find you? Yeah. So, uh, they can find me in Scotland. 
Um, you are more, if you are looking at doing a PhD in the UK, I've made this offer before, feel free to reach out. Um, if you're a pastor, if you're a leader, uh, if you're a lay person, you're thinking, I, I feel like maybe education is something that I want to pursue. Um, please, please reach out, talk to me. Um, you can find me on Instagram, uh, Jared M as in Manchester, Jared M Stacy, uh, on Instagram and then Twitter or X as well. Uh, and Facebook too. I'm also just my website, jaredstacy.com, uh, J A R E D S T A C Y. You can find me there. Um, and yeah, so, uh, I appreciate it. And, uh, hopefully we'll be publishing my dissertation soon, <laughs> submitting this week. So it's exciting. Oh, nice. So we yeah. got you at the right time. Yeah, you did. Yeah. You got, you got all the conclusions. <laughs> That's right. So None of the suspicions. Yeah. And I'm sure, and most likely we will find some reason to bring him back as well. We'll also, once the dissertation is published, we'll let people know about that as well. If they're able to, to find it, read up on it, all that good stuff. So again, his website at the moment is jaredstacy.com. You can find him at Jared M. Stacy on all the different social media channels and all that will be in his guest portal, all of that. Part of the discussion we just had in terms of people of the church needing to learn what it means to be the church again is part of what we're going to spend more time talking about here in January. Um, Dr. Hudson and Joel Bowman are planning on coming back. Um, the Kingdom on the Road guys, we've got a discussion plan dealing with all of this in a Misfits format instead of just the Kingdom on the Road format. So all of that is coming up here in January. But if you didn't know, starting if you're listening to this on release day, Next week, there will not be a regular episode because starting December 13th, we are into the 12 Days of Misfits. So this year, we're back. We're doing season three of 12 Days of Misfits. Brandon is preparing to to come and try to defend, defend his score from last year of actually getting them all right. This year, though, a little bit different. We're doing a carol version instead of just a straight scripture version. So tune in for that. That's every day, short little episodes of me racking Brandon's head and making him wish he had not volunteered to do this. So again, December 13th through the 24th, every day, it'll be on all the different channels. You can subscribe specifically to it on the YouTube podcast. It has its own link there, but everybody else will get it on the normal channels. Um, Also, be on the lookout. We've got some new things coming up in terms of uh, the website is almost rebuilt. It went down for a day, and I don't know why, but it's back up, and it's being rebuilt as well. So be on the lookout for all that. We also have some announcements as far as some team team changes, things like that going on. Um, the store is still up. All the Teak figure is up. Uh, Patreon, patreon.com backslash Mr. Misfits. All the Bible studies are there still, and we are getting ready to start doing... Um, a new one walking through the book of Daniel, honestly, having some of the same discussions we just had. So Jared, again, thanks for coming on. I'm sure we will find excuses to, to continue the discussion in person and online. Um, again, you can find all of his stuff, jaredstacy.com or at Jared M Stacy on all the social media channels. So next week, again, 12 days of misfits coming up. So we will see you all then. The Ministry Misfits podcast is a production of Ministry Misfit Media in association with Overwhelming Victory. Dr. Greg Linville and Andrew Fouts are our executive producers, and Brandon Simmons is associate producer. The Ministry Misfits theme song is written and produced by J.D. Laird and Laird Creative Agency. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at ministrymisfitmedia at gmail.com or by following at Ministry Misfit on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. You can also visit our website at www.ministrymisfits.com or through bio.link backslash Ministry Misfits. If you would like to support Ministry Misfits, you can become a patron by going to patreon.com backslash Ministry Misfits.